So we began our study of the book of Esther, and Esther is an interesting book. And uh, it's an easy book to read because it's kind of almost like in a narrative uh, format. And so often when you're doing your Bible reading, well, it's exciting to get to the book of Esther because it's not like reading Deuteronomy or one of those other books, and it's really easy to get through. But it's kind of hard often to find what does God want to teach me from the book of Esther? And what does he have for me other than this uh, historical lesson? And so it is often difficult if we don't stop to think and we don't stop to ask God what God desires to teach us, then uh, we miss what he would have us to learn. So I've titled my message from this third chapter, Yes, God Cares. And uh, it's often uh, interesting, okay, what title do I use? And it's not that I pick a title and then, you know, build a message around it. It's often you build your message and then all of a sudden you come to a, a title for that message that kind of pertains to what God has introduced, introduced to you through, uh, through it. And so I believe God wants us to uh, know that uh, he is a God who cares for us, his covenant uh, blessed people. And so as I begin, let me open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, pray that you might show us the truths from Esther chapter 3 this morning. That Heavenly Father, we might be able to meet with you in this chapter and see your hand of a provident blessing in this chapter. For we're praying this in your name. Amen. Often I've shared my illustrations from my own personal life and God has blessed me with uh, being able to have a enough varied life to be able to bring different illustrations. And the reason I often bring those illustrations is because I'm introducing you into my life that you might get to know me as I desire that you would get to know me. And then you can more effectively pray, more effectively know where I'm coming from. And so I've shared, I believe already, that uh, we grew up in a home that did not have a television uh, in our home growing up. My dad was of the principle that we did not need such a thing. And so we had to find our entertainment in other areas. And so, because we did not, we had to find uh, times for sports outside or times for reading as our entertainment options. So I fell uh, in love with books and uh, would spend many evenings reading a book. In fact, Dave and I shared a bedroom and so often he would want to read it one evening and uh, he would want to keep the light on and then I would want to go to sleep and so we'd have wars over the light switch. And eventually one of us would get forced out to the hallway to read our books in the hallway. Westerns were a favorite, along with adventure series. The Hardy Boys were a favorite, as well as Danny Orlis books, as well as Louis L'Amour's. And maybe you've never heard of Danny Orlis, but it was a series of books back when I was young. And uh, enjoyed reading those books. And so what each of the books had was an antagonist who was seeking to bring injustice and destruction. They seem to have somebody who would cause great confusion, turmoil, seek to bring uh, injustice. And the heroine of the story would rise against all odds and defeat him. And if you're reading the Hardy Boys, then the Hardy Boys would soon get involved and be able to figure out the mystery and seek to uh, bring restitution to whatever was taking place. The strength of the story was often based upon the strength of the antagonist and the intrigue of seeking to defeat him. And it's even interesting when it comes to movies that the strength of the antagonist is often the strength of that movie, especially those who like the adventure series or those uh, Marvel uh, movies and things like that. There has to be a strong antagonist in that movie for that movie to be able to uh, gross great uh, dividends uh, and, uh, for them. And so the strength of the antagonist has to be there. And so the story would capture me and the hours would pass with little awareness of time or responsibilities. And so often I would read into the early hours of the morning trying to figure out what the adventure was going to be. And so here in chapter 3 of Esther, we are introduced to the antagonist as well. We are introduced to him not only by name, but also his hereditary background. Haman is promoted by King Azurus, but he has also advanced him and established his authority as you read there in verse 1. See, it's not only that he promoted him, but it's also that he... Uh, established him, he advanced him and established his authority, that he was the second in authority across the nation. And with that came certain rights and privileges. 
He is introduced to us after the account of Mordecai's reporting of the plot by two of the, the king's gatekeepers to lay hands on the king. And it was Persian practice to reward good deeds in a quick manner. But nothing is done. And time goes by and Haman is announced the second in command in the land. And so as Mordecai overheard that and reported that news, I'm sure there must have been some thinking on his part that maybe this would have some advantages. What was going to be the reward because that was something that was naturally came down for uh, good deeds like that. And so with this comes the right for the king's servants to bow and pay homage to Haman as he is raised to second in command. And Mordecai was one of the servants at the king's gate. His position may have been advanced by Esther becoming the queen over these past five years as we come to chapter 3. But he was one of many who served the king at the gate. And the king's gate, as it, from an archaeological dig standpoint, they have found that it was a building. It was a, build, a palace complex of some size where the legal, civil, and commercial business was trans transacted on the king's behalf. And so when he says that Mordecai sat in the king's gate, meaning that he had a privileged position that uh, the administration had given to him, and so he might have been one of many at the king's gate. So to be inside the king's gate meant a person was one of the power brokers of the kingdom. Mordecai was in the inner circle, and there must have been an inkling on Mordecai's part that his previous act of protecting the king would uh, bring great reward. But Haman is advanced over him, and there is no mention of his heroic act. And not sure if, not that uh, Mordecai would have done it looking for a reward, but he's sure that he thought of the, the possibility that something was to come back for him because for doing that. But nothing is done, and time goes on. And so we are told of Haman's background. We're not told of Haman's background or qualifications, other than that he is the son of Hamanatha, and that he is an Agite. And so the author is put in the biblical account specifically as it is important, important to the setting. They could have just introduced him as Haman, but the author of Esther puts into the account that he is the son of Hamadatha, and that also that he is an Agite, because it is important to the story. Haman's history is tied back to the Amalekites in Exodus 17, verses 8 to 16. And if you were to read that account, you would see that that was the time when the Israelites were coming towards the promised land that God had promised to them. And they got asked permission if they might transfer uh, through their land. And they were refused, and the Amalekites came out against them. They, as a nation, opposed Israel as they approached the promised land. The battle resulted in Joshua overwhelming the Amalekites and God swore at that time that the Lord will make war against Amalek from generation to generation. So God presented a curse upon the Amalekites at that time that war would go on from generation to generation. You can continue over to look at Deuteronomy 25, 17 to 18. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 25. And let's look at verses 17 and 18. Deuteronomy chapter 25, looking at verse 17 and 18. Remember what Amalek did to you along the way when you came out from Egypt. How he met you along the way and attacked among you all the stragglers at your rear when you were faint and weary. And he did not fear God. Therefore, it shall come about when... He when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your surrounding enemies in the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You must not forget. And so it was a challenge to the people. Don't forget what Amalek has done. When all of a sudden you have gained that rest in the land that God is, all that God has promised to you, don't forget what Amalek has done to you and to take care of that. See, Amalek was a grandson of Esau. And so Saul, in 1 Samuel 15, 1-3, is uh, commanded to go and take care of the Amaleks, to wipe them out. And if you remember the story that uh, he sought to wipe them out, but he brought Agag, the king, back with him, and much of the prime uh, animals as well. And so Samuel had to take matters into his own hand and take care of the king Agag at that time. Because, Sam, because Saul did not carry out what God had asked him to do. And so it was at that time that God regretted making Saul king and basically was in the process of removing him at that time. 
Samuel had to take matters into his own hand. Amalek and King Agag pictured to us an enemy that opposed all that God desired to do. So if there was a person to take the second position in the kingdom, the question would be, why does it have to be this man? Why does it have to be somebody, the son or the relative of the Agites? That would be the worst person for somebody from the Jewish community. There surely had to be a better choice than Haman, an enemy of the Jewish people. It would be a dangerous thing for Haman to find out that Mordecai was a Jew. And so Mordecai hid that he was a Jew for a long period of time. We're not told how Haman moved up the ranks or why he was Azurza's choice to be prime minister. But we are soon made aware of his character and that his motives were not that he would be a servant of the people. We soon see Haman's character come through. Yes, he might have had some great achievements in the past. There must have been something that made the king aware of who Haman was and a reason for bringing him into that position. As Xerxes was a young man, and at the beginning of the story of Esther, we, he could have been as young as 18 years old at that time. And so a few years have gone by now, and still a relatively young person. But there must have been something in Haman's past that would have made him the, become a, the, the king to take awareness of him. So Mordecai refuses to bow to this man. We're not told of, this, of his reasoning for his refusal, the reason he gives to his co-workers after their insistence. Because you can't imagine this going on day after day as Haman approaches the, uh, the administrative block. And maybe Haman even had his office in this block. And so every day as, the, as Haman came, all the office would get up and would bow and pay homage to him. And Mordecai refused. So day after day, I'm sure they asked him, what are you doing? Do you know that you're, are you even in your right mind? Turn into something like this. Do you know what could happen for failing to bow down? But for whatever reason, Mordecai refuses to bow. And eventually, he tells them that he is a Jew. And so, these Jew, his, his co-workers, take this excuse to Haman and see if it's a valid excuse. And so, it looks like even in that time, there was inter-office rivalries going on. And I'm sure that they, maybe uh, somebody envied uh, Mordecai's position and said, now is a great time to take that position. And so I'm going to report this to Haman. And Haman's response is one of rage. And so it's not just anger. It's actually rage and looking and sought to do something about it. It was a controlling factor that became a consuming focus and a, and a passion. There would have been much that was involved in this position of being the prime minister. But it's, it's interesting to see that this anger became all-encompassing in his life. It seemed to almost take him and almost gain possession of Haman and uh, his focus. And so imagine there's probably a little other time for doing something other than, uh, than uh, trying to figure out how to take care of, uh, of Mordecai in that situation. If we allow anger to dwell in our lives, it will overwhelm us as well. If we allow anger to become a dominant factor and we don't deal with the anger that we have, it will have a negative effect in our lives. Yes, the Word of God says that we can be angry and sin not. And so there is a, a righteous anger. But if we allow anger to take hold of us, then it will control us and moves us in actions that do not work the righteousness of God. And so Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says, Therefore we are told not to let the sun go down on our anger, not to give the devil an opportunity. Because when we allow anger as a focus in our life, when we fail to deal with the anger in our lives, then we have allowed an opening for Satan to come in and bring an attack upon us. We give Satan an opportunity. We allow him an opening in our lives whereby he can attack from. And then James 1.20 says, Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. We need to deal with the anger if that, if that is our position and that is our state. If something brings us to anger, we need to look at it and evaluate it. And we need to take care of it because it will affect us. If we allow it to continue on in our lives, then there's multiple other symptoms that can come. It can either move us to anxiety, maybe even can move us into depression, can move us into multiple different health issues that uh, can come if we don't deal with it in our lives. See, whenever the two Hebrew words for bowing and paying homage are combined in the Old Testament, they mostly always refer to worshiping and reverencing God. So if this was a factor in Mordecai's decision, we are not told whether he understood that. 
And that was his position. Mordecai is the only one standing when Haman makes his entrance to the palace. And so Haman did not deal directly with Mordecai's indiscretion, but he saw this as an opportunity to take care of the whole nation of the Jews. And so imagine that uh, Haman would have been familiar with the history. He would have been familiar with the Amalekites' feelings towards the Jewish people. And maybe he saw that his new position would grant him an opportunity to be able to do something against this group of people finally. And so there could have been as many as 15 million people dispersed across the nation. And so as we look at the the nation at that time, there could have been as many as 15 million Jewish people across the nation. And so Haman decides to do something to take care of this, what he thinks is a problem. And Haman calls in the astrologers and the soothsayers to find the best date for his actions against the Jews to take by casting the dice. First of the year was the usual time for setting the major events of the calendar year. And it was a regular practice in the Persian Empire that they would determine major events by the casting of dice. And it wasn't that every day they sought to cast the dice. But at the first of the year, there was a system that they had in place. Let's figure out the best date for this. And so they would cast the dice until they found the best date. Okay, that's the date for that event. And so as Haman calls in the astrologers and soothsayers, they start casting the dice. And it's almost like they had to cast the dice 360 some times before they found the ideal date for taking care of the Jewish people. And so the first year, was, as I said, was the usual time for setting the major events of the calendar year. And the day that came up for the program, the elimination of the Jews, came up as the 13th day of the 12th month. And the day that they began to start casting was actually the day before the Passover uh, event in the Jewish calendar. And so those that were in, in uh, Susa here, the capital city, when they would have gotten this news of this event, it was either the day before the Passover or it would have been the day of the Passover event. And that's a significant event in the Jewish mindset. They would have remembered back to the, their time in Egypt, their ancestors' time in Egypt, where God delivered them. And it should have been a major event in their calendars and their thinking. Wow, God delivered us at that time. But for whatever reason, they forgot about the past actions. So was it chance that this date, seemingly of the 13th of the, the 12th month, was chosen? We know from Proverbs 16, 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's, but it's every decision is from the Lord. The Lord chose that date specifically, far down the road for some reason. So the message should have been clear to the nation of Israel as God had delivered them as a nation at the Passover. He is well able to do so again. And see, often God brings major events into our lives. And we see God's hand through those events. And the reason being that we might see God's hand in the past as he dealt with those major situations. Whereby when all of a sudden something comes up into our lives once again, we might have opportunity to remember God's hand was, got me through this in the past. God is well able to get me through this next event that I'm facing in my life. But we are forgetful people often. See, the Jewish nation were, the covenant, were in a covenant relationship bearers with God the Father. They were exiled by God for their transgressions. But this did not mean that they were forgotten or neglected by God. Just because God had sought to deal with them in discipline, it was not a sign that God was deserting them. It was actually, if you look into the book of Hebrews, you see that discipline is a sign of love. We should look forward to those times of discipline when God does discipline us. Because then we can realize God loves me and God is seeking to correct my patterns. And so even though they were uh, exiled, it was not that God had deserted them. But God was, was still yet looking out for them. See, they may have been lured into passivity as everything seemingly looked good. Yes, they were in captivity, but they were still seeming to move on with their lives. In fact, this group here that we are talking about here had not gone back with the first wave in the return to Jerusalem. They had continued in the land for whatever reason. Maybe they had successful businesses already. Maybe they had uh, land and maybe they had much livestock. And for whatever reason, they had not returned. And so maybe they were, had been lured into passivity at this time. They were seeing great success as seen by the wish of the attackers to seize and plunder their possessions. 
Why would there have been so much excitement that uh, they might plunder the Jewish people if they did not have much to uh, be able to plunder from? And so I imagine there was much looking at uh, them as a nation. Wow, I really like that nice boat that that guy's got. Man, in a few months, that's going to be mine. I'm going to make sure that I get that. Or maybe that guy's got a nice oxen pair there. And man, that sure would look good on my uh, property. And so imagine already the lusting was going on for those that were going to take over the, the Jewish uh, possessions. They had a queen who was one of them, even if it was hidden. Mordecai was a leading official at the, in the king's gate as well. He was Jewish. They had a group that had returned to Israel, so the back door was open as well. But at the drop of a writ, their world is turned on end. The end of the chapter shares that the capital was in confusion. The past deliverances are forgotten and anxiety sets in. See, often our first reaction to, to, in, in, to finding out insurmountables is that we all of a sudden seemingly fall apart. We have a greater propensity to trust in our own uh, human institutions than in the God who often works through human institutions. And too often in our lives, we are about seeking to pre prepare ourselves against those troubling times that might may come. And so we are all the time working on ways that we don't have to depend upon God in our lives. We come in, uh, in our own lives, we are seeking to present and put in place different uh, things that we can not have to rely upon God. And it's not that uh, God doesn't ask us to uh, build for tomorrow or count the cost. But too often our, our rest, our dependence is upon those things and not upon God. Because we do not see God or even that he is mentioned does not mean that he is not providentially working. The providence of God is God's act of purposefully providing for or sustaining and governing the world. Whether that be during the days of the Babylonian Persian captivity or our current situation. The providence of God is still active in, in the direction of the situations we are facing and instead of growing anxious in our circumstances, we can rest in the fact that God is on the throne. Last March, the writ came down across Canada, and even for Saskatchewan. All of a sudden, we were meeting one Sunday, and the next Sunday, no, we couldn't meet any longer. Anxiety set in. What are we going to do? Our whole world is turned upside down. This is terrible. I'm going to fall apart. And we found out that God is still on the throne. That even through a situation like that, we can still walk victoriously in the Christian life. We can still walk with him even in this trial. And even if there's another trial that comes after this, can we still rest in that our God is on the throne? And whatever he has for us, I can walk dependently and rest upon him, knowing that whatever he has for me is going to be for my good and for his glory? Or is our first response going to be to throw up our arms? And see that my life is falling apart. See, the story of Esther is the story for us today. As they face seemingly insurmountables in their life, we can look at these seeming insurmountables in our own lives and say, no, God is on the throne. I can rest in him. Yes, I don't know what he has for me in and through this. And as Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And if that were something that God would have for me, yes, I would but yet trust him. Yes, I would need his grace to walk through it. But the story of Esther is the story for us today in our situation as we walk through the seeming pandemic. Whatever you want to call it, the seeming time where the government all of a sudden brought this writ down upon us. And who knows what the next writ may be. So may God prepare our hearts and may we remember Esther and the provident hand of God even though we don't seemingly see God in the midst of this we can rest in the fact that God has not left, God has not departed, God is still here, God is still on the throne, and we have the privilege of daily entering into his presence. Are we, the body of Christ, doing that? Are we approaching the throne? Say, God, this concerns me, this situation. God, this hurts. God, I don't understand what you're doing. And God is but overjoyed to say, thank you for bringing that to me. Let me show you what I want to do in and through this. Would you just rest in me in the midst of this? See, God invites us to come on to him and find his rest. So the question this morning is, are you at rest? Or is your heart in turmoil, anxious, multiple different directions, 
not understanding, are we going to simply just come back to God and say, God, I'm going to sit at your feet and stare upon you and your beauty. May we be people who find our rest in God. There was only one thing in the way of Haman achieving his desire to eliminate the Jewish people. He needed the king's permission. So Haman presents a truth, a half-truth, and a complete lie. A certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom is the truth. He moves to a half-truth. Their laws are different from those of all people. And then to the full lie, they do not observe the king's laws. The conclusion of the argument is that it is, one, it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. The king should destroy them and Haman would reimburse him for the expense. And so it's almost like the slick operator comes in and he seeks to woo the king, smooth talk him over to getting his direction. And maybe he was a great communicator. And maybe that was the reason why he'd been put into that position because he had a great voice and he had a great communication skills. And so he wins the king over. The amount he offered him is the equivalent of two-thirds of the annual revenue. And so I sought to find out if you look at 10,000 pieces of silver, 10,000 uh, talents of silver, if you look at that in today's money, it could have added up to about $362 million in today's money if you look at the, what silver uh, costs today. It was a significant amount of money. And I'm not sure if the king's coffers at that time were seeking to get, get a little, go a little low. Because if you remember your history, uh, the king had gone to, uh, to battle against the Greeks. And in two different battles, he lost at that time. So I'm not sure if his coffers were going low at this time. And that might have been a, a significant enticement as well. A program is generated simply because one man would not bow. Genocide is put into motion because of hatred and greed. And Satan is again seeking to move mankind to eliminate his people and maybe even eliminate the line of the coming deliverer. This is not the only attempt as our recent hi history bears testimony of. What it, does, what it takes to all of a sudden bring some into that place. And in this case, one person's refusal to bow down all of a sudden sought to brought about a uh, desire to wipe them out as a nation. Hitler gained power because of one vote. Not sure if you realize that. That he came to power over the difference of one vote. And then multiple times in our history, major events were determined because of one vote, because somebody didn't decide to stand up against him. The king just took the word of Haman and he handed him the signet ring to make it official. He does not ask for the name of those who are not observing his laws. There is no asking for evidence. See, when the two eunuchs who guarded the door conspired against the king, there was an investigation. Then, when the, there is the possibility of wiping out a whole group of people, there is no show of due process. And it's almost like he smoothed over the king, and the king was willing to go along with whatever Haman decided. There is little concern for the ramifications of the decision shown in the king and Haman sitting down to drink together. And this was to affect as many as 15 million people. The antagonist thinks he has the situation under control and he just has to wait for the right time for it to come. The anticipation on his part is over the top. Everything has fallen into place. Now there is nothing but to sit back and enjoy life and the vision of the nation without the Jewish people. But he was blinded to an important fact. And often we are blinded to the important fact as well. That God is the one who is on the throne. May we never forget that aspect that Everybody answers to God. And even if you look at the book of Job and Satan came before God to report and he got permission from God to be able to act against Job. Our God is on the throne. And so we're reminded once again of Ephesians 3 verse 12 as I shared a few weeks back. In whom we have. May we never forget that the, in whom we have is the Lord Jesus Christ who dwells with us. The Jewish people were in covenant relationship with the creator of the universe and God had made covenant with them that he would never desert or forsake them. They might be unfaithful, but he never is. We might be unfaithful, but God is never uh, unfaithful. We might have moved away from him, but God is still faithful. 
If we are a child of God, if the Holy Spirit indwells us and we are one of his, we are in a covenant relationship with God himself. And God, as a covenant bearer with us, has agreed to watch over us, to take care of us. Their human government contacts did not prevent this edict, and all their preparations for the future were not going to be sufficient for this crisis. They were forced back to resting on the Lord's deliverance. Their world was threatening to fall in upon them. Many questions come to mind at times like this. What did I do to deserve this? Does God hate me? Is God unfair? Has he forgotten me? And often when those insurmountables come into our own life, those are what come, the questions of life. God, where are you in this? You know what? We don't often understand as we walk through those insurmountables in our life, but yet we can depend on the fact that we do have God. God has not deserted us. We have but to rest in him and walk with him, whatever he has, knowing that in God, he is enough. And God is always the covenant-keeping God. In the chapters ahead, we will see even though God is not mentioned, he is still providently holding his people in his hand. He raises up individuals and removes others. The circumstances of our life may look impossible but make no earth, and make no earthly sense. But God wants us to know that not a hair of our heads falls without his knowing. He cares for the birds of the air, and we are so much more than they. The lilies of the field are displayed in more splendor than even Solomon. God's care for his exiles is on display throughout the book of Esther. And God wants us to know unequivocally that he cares for you, his child. So whether we see God, whether he seemingly it looks like he is left and departed, we can but rest in the fact that God is yet working behind the scenes, that we are in his hands, and we can rest in him, whatever the seeming insurmountable that may come. Whether it be this past insurmountable that we walk through with COVID, or whether it be the next one that may be on the horizon, we, the body of Christ, can say, in whom I have, and I can rest in that fact. Because God is the provident providential keeping God and he is on the throne may we not forget that part and that fact let me close this time this morning in a word of prayer dear Heavenly Father thank you for your word thank you for showing us your character traits through the book of Esther that Heavenly Father against any antagonist that you are more than enough there's nothing that can stand against you that Heavenly Father, that you are on the throne and whether we understand it or not, we have but to rest in you because you have shown us your character and who you are through your word. And so Heavenly Father, you are on display on every page of your word that you've given to us. May we, your people, grow to know you and rest in you in whatever situation you have for us. And so thank you, Heavenly Father, for showing yourself powerful in uh, Esther's uh, situation and the Jewish situation there and our situation as well. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you.